Hello, everyone, and welcome to the After Show, the Partially Examined Life po podcast on Recur. Uh, I may be the least prepared host in the history of hosts in the entire world. Like, of, of any host that has ever existed on planet Earth, I may be the least prepared. But who better to lean on than my good friends that are here today? The, the celebrity philosopher, the Kantian captivator himself, Wes Allman, is in the building with us. How are you, Wes? Good. How are you? I'm fantastic. Uh, in keeping with how we've done things in the past, I'm going to go through and uh, organize it a bit so that you guys can get a name to a voice. Michael is here, broadcasting live from South London. How are you? Good evening. I'm fine, thank you. He is fine, and uh, you'll recognize his voice from the last episode on Gautam, where he had so many interesting insights, he wanted to come back and grace us with his wisdom again. Uh, Ken is also here with us today. Ken, how are you? Great, thanks. Uh, glad to be here. Sure, we can expect great things from you. And the Count, Daniel, is here with us today. How are you, Dan? Hi, I'm good. Okay, awesome. So now Sorry that we've gotten to those video. pleasantries, let's get on to the actual subject matter. I believe, I mean, Wes said that we might have Law joining us later. We may have uh, Moog joining us. He usually drops in. One of my greatest friends. Anyway, so, I mean, I guess if we're going to keep going with how we've done things in the past, let me just start by oversimplifying some aspect of Recur, and then you guys can pick it apart, and it can be sort of a launching pad for the conversation. All right, so I'd, I'd like you all to open your Bibles to Deuteronomy 22, <laughs> verse 21. Mm -hmm. um, and the Lord said, quote, Then they shall bring out the damsel to the door of her father's house, and the men of her city shall stone her with stones that she die because she hath wrought folly in Israel, to play the whore in her father's house, so shalt thou put evil away among you. End quote. Now, I need to be open-minded here. I, I, I need to put my, my modern-day prejudices and biases about this being you know, primitive man's uh, attempt to subjugate women to keep them as inferior beings. I need to put those up for grabs and be willing to have them uh, converted to some other time. But really, what are they saying here? Bros before hoes, right? I mean, they, they aren't really saying we should stone women to death. This is something that, if it, if done in modern times, it could easily be taken as just a beautiful statement. Am I right? That, I mean, that's essentially what Recur's saying it in, in some respects. Hey, can I stop you for just a second? I'm hearing static. Are you hearing that? I think it's Ken. Let me, uh, um, Ken, you might want to mute yourself when you're not talking. Um, I'll mute. Okay. Or I'm he still, mute. still well, hearing it. Yeah, he'll... Here, I'll mute. And then he can unmute when he wants to talk. And then okay. I'll mute him when he's done. Okay, but it just happened. There we go. Okay, so bros before hoes. That's basically what he's saying, right? What passage is that again? Say that again. Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 22, verse 21. Right, okay. Let me have a look in detail before we start ranting. I think you will agree after you do your hermeneutical analysis of the Bible with me. Okay. Well, the reason I, I, think I, I can offer an observation on that. I'm sorry, what? Um, uh, on the issue of uh, you know, stoning the maidens. The, one of the issues we still have now in the 21st century is we do have you know, certain areas of the world and certain cultures in which behavior like that is considered you know, an, uh, an example of high moral thinking and uh, completely appropriate to now, it's unfortunate that we do have people who think that way, but you know, one of the questions in contemporary world politics is, you know, do we have certain societies that are stuck in the, in the Old Testament as opposed to the rest of us who are trying to you know, live in the 21st century? So that, you know, a question arises for understanding the text that comes from this you know, uh, historically distant period. Um, are we understanding? Are we to understand that text as situated in its own contemporaneous history, or should we uh, uh, should we try to understand the same text within our own time period? And uh, with which perspective are we doing more uh, you know, honor to the text or more violence to the text? Yeah, um, go on. No, um, I. I I, I'm sorry, go ahead, Michael. I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Uh, well, no, I mean, my habit is, is to always speak too much, so please feel free. Um, but I was going to say that, um, <clears throat> that I mean, one of the things I often quote in uh, 
the discussions about religion, and especially uh, over literalist interpretations of scripture, I asked the person who, presumably the new atheist or the anti-theist, who am I having an argument with, despite being an atheist myself, is do they think there was any good intention behind or any good faith behind these words? That at some point in time they had some value to that community that was progressive. And invariably the answer is no, that they don't think that. But I'm not quite convinced. I think if you look at uh, preceding cultures that are prior to the ones the Bible is addressing, uh, or the, at least these passages are addressing, you find much worse standards of religious and social practice. I mean, if you look at um, men being asked to marry women that they've raped, the alternative in that society was destitution for the women and no responsibility for the men. Uh, if you're talking within the confines of just the available behaviors or, or options at the time, that isn't to say the rule is good. But by contrasting the previous culture and the one the societal rules are trying to address, you can find in that comparison uh, a progressive element, and you can interpret that progressive element as saying, you know, whatever you like. Well, not quite whatever you like, but at least something moral, like um, if you take animal take a, a animal sacrifice, for example, in the Bible, that was to try and persuade people to not engage in human sacrifice. And if you say, well, what, what's the point of you know sacrificing a chicken and spraying, bringing its blood all over the house and things, you might say, well, we should value human life, and that's the interpretation of that passage about using animal sacrifice, is that, that implicitly we shouldn't value human life, and, and so on and so on and so on. Yeah, well, I mean... Pardon me if I'm holding it to a higher standard, because it's supposedly revelation. It's supposedly the codified word of the creator of the universe as pervaded through, uh, albeit flawed, human beings. It's not just supposed, like, it being progressive compared to what humans have independently arrived at in the past does not make it necessarily, I mean, I, I, I feel like I'm holding it to a higher standard. Is that wrong of me? When you talk about stoning women to death as a means of punishing them for being promiscuous, and, and that is something that is an idea that's relayed by the creator of the universe, it just seems like a, I, I think maybe I'm making a mistake by holding it to a higher standard. Am I? Mm. Yes. Um, the, Say more. Uh, the, um, the, I, I think there's... What I, what I heard, um, I, I guess it was Law saying, was that there's, a, there's an application of the principle of charity here. And that by understanding the, um, the the author of the text as the historically placed individual, you know, writing at a specific time and trying to uh, you know, communicate something worthwhile to their readers at that, that specific time, um, you can find a certain kind of uh, value in the message that's being recorded and communicated. On the other hand. If you think of the author of the text as this you know, timeless, eternal uh, you know, source of, of value, you know, the creator of the universe, then uh, um, you might not, uh, you know, the, the principle of charity applied with that kind of an assumption would give you a higher standard, and it would uh, you know, let you reject the comments, you know, the, the instructions to stone. Uh, um, Wandering young people uh, as uh, as uh, morally inappropriate. So the, uh, the 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 hermeneutic question I would say rests in uh, how do you apply the principle of charity? Do you apply the principle of charity to a human speaker with a historical situation, or do you apply the principle of charity to uh, to an, an eternal speaker who is supposedly omniscient and omnipotent? In which case, uh, you really cut the guy a lot of the slack. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So does anybody have a way to clear that up? Because I, uh, I mean, I feel like. So I wanted to note that Law is on, by the way. How are you Hello, doing, Law? Hello, gentlemen. How are you? Good. So great. So great to hear your voice. And maybe you can clear this up for me. I see. I, I'm totally on board with it being s subjective. I'm, t I'm totally on board with having a a new. I, I I I totally get that some parts of the Bible we need to interpret 
differently and maybe the sentiment that was being conveyed to the people of the time in the the historicity you know in the the, the intention of it I, I get that that may not that we there, there, there needs to be updates to that I'm sorry I uh, having a hard time articulating this so no, take your time take your time but um I when it comes to actually stoning women to death for being promiscuous, I'm having a hard time finding the the modern, more tolerant version of that, or the meaning that the creator of the universe was trying to convey behind that. Like, what is the actual thing that Christianity is representing there? Well, well or the, I, the, the Old Testament. I'm sorry. No, if, I, if I might just quickly point out that only in the last hundred years have women had the economic and biological freedom for promiscuity not to have significant consequences on their lives in terms of their being pregnant and having to support children and the financial and political and social burdens that carries. I mean, promiscuity in ancient times was a radically different uh, kind of moral problem when you have scarcity of resources, you don't have a capitalist economy producing surplus, <laughs> to put it in economic terms. You know, so when you say, well, aren't these people awful for regulating female behavior this way? And then you say, well, you know, people have to have limits on their behavior owing to the predicaments they find themselves in, in the context of the social, geographic, resource, moral, etc. context they find themselves in. And when I said earlier that you have to look at the prior culture and the, what the rules say compared to the prior culture to understand the intention, I mean, we do that all the time. In our in our recent history, I mean, if if you know Thomas Jefferson said, you know, don't don't put gunpowder in your musket all the time, uh, I think we could translate that translate that fairly well to a principle of um, you look know, look after the things that are dangerous that you have control over, or principle of responsibility or something. So, so what know, is that a uh, greater message that's behind the stoning the women to death? You're saying that there's a scarcity of resources and uh, women need to be held accountable for wantonly having sex. It just seems like they could have easily gone the other direction. They could have used guys. If if thou penis enterseth another vagina, you shall be stoned to death. <laughs> if, if if I may weigh in uh, briefly, gentlemen, um, and 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 Michael, I think it's I think it's you, Michael. Man, I love your setup, man. That's awesome. I, I love that yeah. in the background, by the way. Anyway, uh, n nevertheless, I, I think one of the things that we're wrestling with here is something that feminist theologians and feminist hermeneutical scholars have always pointed out is that we have to wrestle with the people who are writing this text, and and although although there are certainly divine nuggets, if, you, if you'll allow me that reference. There are certainly divine nuggets that are happening there. Uh, we're still dealing with men writing within the context of a patriarchal society uh, who are writing in a way that advances their interest, which opens the door, of course, to more problems in other areas of the text. But I think in particular to this situation that we're talking about, and I believe it's you, Stephen, that's kind of raising this issue, and I think you're raising it uh, rightfully, is that we're dealing with patriarchy here. We're dealing with misogyny here. Um, and we're dealing with something that is intended to marginalize women. I mean, let's just go ahead and call that what it is. Um, and so although there are, there are problems with that, what Recur asks us to do is to approach this text with a hermeneutic of suspicion that should, um, and this is the reason why womenists, why feminists, why uh, race people like myself, race scholars, uh, while we love this hermeneutic of suspicion because it allows us to strip away some of these problematic overlays over the text and dig down to if there are truths that are beneath them. Um, and so to, to, to get more specifically to your question than Stephen, what is specifically at the heart of this that is that makes it theologically of importance? I mean, that we would have to do really dig into this text and try to figure out what specifically is going on with the context and whatnot. Um, but there are explanations as, um, oh man, I forgot, I forgot what your name is, sir. Uh, but Ken, I believe, what Ken pointed out is that there are explanations that we can point to the historical circumstances that that explain, and also I believe it was Stephen, Michael, who pointed this out as well, that we can point to historical explanations for why certain kinds of decrees are made. But uh, in order for us to try to, you know, try to understand it the implications of that in our time period, it, it requires of us to employ this hermeneutic of suspicion to dig down into what does this have to say to us that would be relevant. So I, I think you are, Stephen, pointing out a very important point that feminists and womanists and many other uh, scholars who have used the hermeneutic of suspicion have 
pointed out that there are problematic problems, you know, there are problematic things in the text, but we can dig underneath them using these kinds of hermeneutical tools to see what is there that's worth keeping and what is there that perhaps needs to be tossed aside, quite frankly. So it seems like a daunting task. As I mean, as somebody that does this on a regular basis, I mean, like, do you ever find it difficult to find a distinction to, between or do you ever feel uncomfortable making the distinction between, say, this verse out of Deuteronomy where you deem it to be misogynistic and, say, the divinity of Jesus at all? Like, is it difficult to distinguish? But, I mean, how do you separate the wheat from the chaff? How do you, as a mere yeah. mortal man, uh, determine between which things God actually meant and which things he was just kind of speaking during the time period metaphorically about? I think that's a very good question, and to be honest... Uh, the way that I approach what text that I'm going to preach and which text I'm not going to preach, what text I'm going to teach from, which text I'm not going to teach from, I, I approach it with what speaks to me. And if something speaks uh, speaks something to me that is, you know, you know, uh, inspiring or something that, uh, uh, you know, adequately approaches the, you know, if I can be more specific, okay. So, so Paul Tillich says that the charisma is supposed to speak to any existential situation. So, what he says is that is that you know, given any existential problem that happens in life, that there should be something in the gospel, the kerygma, the, you know, the euangelion, uh, that, that truth that speaks to that situation. And so what I do, the way that I approach my sermons is I oftentimes, usually it has something to do with liberation or social justice or something, but nevertheless, I, I, I ask myself, what is the situation that I want to speak to today? You know, what, what do I feel needs to be addressed? And then what I will do is I will then, you know, search the text to see what speaks to me, and then I will try to construct out of the text, um, you know, in a faithful way uh, and, and address that situation. And so I don't approach the text by saying, by hopscotching, if you will, and saying, okay, I'm not going to, you know, touch this. I just kind of approach it in a holistic way and say, well, it speaks to me. Now, more often than not, Deuteronomy are uh, usually doesn't speak to me uh, that much, to be honest, nor does Numbers, uh, nor does Leviticus, but that's just the nature of those texts. That's just a whole bunch of laws. Um, whereas inspiring text like the Exodus, if you will, the first half of Exodus, rather, um, where there's a group of slaves who get liberation from a divine being, well, that speaks something to me. And, and, and I think that's something that, that even the slaves, you know, resonated with them uh, and inspired me in their spirituals. And so I'm able to see something divine there, even if, you know, I don't want to, I usually don't get into debates in my, you know, in my, in my preaching about the divinity of certain texts, but I can say that this narrative is an inspiring narrative and can communicate to you that, uh, kind of using King's terminology that, you know, the arc of, you know, the arc of the universe does bend towards justice. And so that's kind of how I approach it. I, I really don't do that heavy lifting and saying, well, this text I'm not going to preach from because I don't feel it to be divinely inspired or I find it to be problematic and there's just too much hermeneutical work for me to do to get past that patriarchal and misogynistic information to get to the kernels that I want to kind of address. I just kind of go at it you know, the, the reverse way. You know, I, I kind of use kind of a situational kind of approach, a Talikian approach and a Bartian mm -hmm. approach where I have a situation that I'm trying to address and I use the text to address the situation in the way that I feel to be consistent and uh, ethical, if that makes so, any but, sense. No, it totally does, and if the criteria you use is that it needs to be inspirational to you, I, and I mean, this is just me playing uh, devil's advocate here, why, Sorry. I mean, what, what would you say to somebody that said, why don't you use a completely different book to draw inspiration from and to preach to people about, like, say, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. There's tons of inspirational things in that book. Sure, I, I do quite frequently. <laughs> See, that's the thing about me. I'm a, I'm a weird guy, man. I, I will say that that the divine text, um, and really, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you here, that the divine text, particularly the Bible, is the mo is the one that speaks to me the most. But uh, the Quran speaks to me. Um, you know, you know the, the Gita speaks to me, things like that. And, and I have quite frequently used those texts uh, within the context of preaching. But for me, uh, just coming from my situation, coming from the way that I was reared, uh, coming from what it has meant to black people historically, that that text really genuinely speaks to me in a, in a, in a unique and particular way. And so I will admit that there are, there are cultural things that are happening within me that uh, allows that to speak more more clearly, um, but but nevertheless, I do use those other texts uh, quite frequently, you know, for illustration purposes, not necessarily for you know divine purposes. But 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 I will say that there is something with me about a text. Now, the latest of these are going to be you know two thousand or so years old, but there's something about a text that has consistently. Uh, spoken to people over generations that really resonates with me, that, that people 
both inside of my cultural context and outside of my cultural context have drawn from this text something that is inspiring. And so for me, uh, that, that speaks something about the longevity, uh, the depth of insight uh, about a particular text um, that, that allows for me to be more comfortable with saying that it is, uh, I, I would argue, divinely inspired, but I would not say divine. I don't make, a, I don't make an idol of the text. Uh, but I will say that there's something divine going on there and how you want to define divine. Uh, I like the way that, that rhymed there. But the way that you want to define divine uh, is, is open to interpretation for me. I'm very comfortable with being a, a, a rather liberal thinker in that, in that way. But uh, there is something for me divinely, divine going on there because of the longevity of the text. I feel like I'm talking too much, guys. No, 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 you're, you're, you're totally not. You are the resident expert, and I'd like to ask you one more further question on what you just said, and then can I'm sorry again. I'm I'm completely monopolizing the conversation, but so, what would you say to somebody who's a follower of Islam? Who's I mean, they can point to a lot like centuries of people who have garnered inspiration from the Quran. Would you say that yeah. you you would have to using your same criterion of what is legitimate say that mm -hmm. I mean that too is divinely inspired. Uh, to, to be honest, I'm not an exclusivist, uh, and so I'm, I'm comfortable with saying that God speaks to people um, in different ways that is that is most you know consistent with their cultural circumstances. And so I'm I'm not I'm not yet uh, to a place where I'm saying that there is only one way that all other ways are completely wrong. I'm, I'm very comfortable with the saying that God speaks to uh, all of these different traditions. And so although um, I would make the claim that that God is most fully revealed in my tradition, um, I'm not going to say in any kind of arrogant or exclusivist way uh, to say that, that God cannot be revealed in any other tradition. I'm very comfortable with, you know, I think that God's big enough for all traditions and not just, for, you know, God's not only found in mine. Well, part of your tradition is the uh, great passage of Jesus coming down with a sword and casting people into a lake of fire if they yeah, don't believe. Yeah, so yeah. I, I get that there's like a hermeneutical subjectivism there. We, we could say that we just toss that out. But I, I guess what I'm getting at is, is that there are mutually exclusive claims in these religions. In yours, which Sarah. supposedly is the most divinely inspired, mm -hmm. it, it seems like I mean, a big part of that is that if you don't believe in the divinity of Jesus, it seems like that's an integral part of it. Then you will be cast into that lake of fire. In fact, the vast, I vast majority of the, the vast, ahead, vast majority of humans that have ever existed will be cast into the lake of fire. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to uh, get hermeneutics as as a as a topic, you know, as a method, you know, back into the discussion here, because I I think it has a very useful role. The um, the one of the questions that faces every kind of religion, you know, um, very much nowadays, uh, but it, it's been a, it's been a problem throughout history, is uh, is the issue of fundamentalism. Oh, absolutely. You know, a a lot of us want a lot. There's a lot of people, and especially a lot of secularists, who would like to see fundamentalism simply erased. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand. Um, there isn't anybody who reads, you know, uh, an ancient text, and that goes from, from the Old Testament or, or the Quran or the Iliad or Beowulf. Now, everyone, everyone wants to make sure that we're getting out of these texts as much as we can. So, so the wh whatever uh, you know, wisdom or information or uh, however we can use these to inform our lives, we want to make sure we're exposing ourselves to these texts. On the other hand, we want to make sure that we're not just running off uh, maniacally, you know, pretending that everything they say is literally true. And one of the Good things point. I think is most valuable about the, um, the methodology of hermeneutics is that it can, and I think this is actually, a, I'm proposing this more as a research topic than just trying to argue for it here, but I, I think hermeneutics can give us a way to argue against fundamentalism and say that the real value of these texts comes not from taking them as you know, the verbal plenary inspiration you know, of, of an uh, omniscient divine being, but instead as uh, historical documents in which you know, a positive force in the world incrementally you know, advanced you know, human moral character. And I think that that's what uh, uh, that, that's the point that Michael was making earlier, that the uh, uh, it was um, adultery was treated much worse, you know, it, it, before uh, these aspects of the law were were made part of you know, Hebrew culture, 
And it's it's a significant advance, just like you know, the Code of Hammurabi was a significant advance, you know, in uh, uh, in the Persian Empire. So we, we can look at um, you know, from a secular point of view, we see the progress of reason throughout history. From a spiritual point of view, I think you can see the you know the progress of God through history, mm -hmm. and you, that that's just as much uh, divinity you know, present in the text as. Uh, uh, as supposing that it's verbal plenary inspiration, and that you know one reading of it has to be applied uh, um, for all time. No, I think that's well said, Ken. I think that is really well said. And and also, Stephen, if I can kind of address your point within the context of what Ken just said, that uh, it it is true that one perspective in Christianity is that you know Jesus is going to come back in, in, in a particular kind of way, the rapture, or whatnot. Uh, but to be honest, that's a hermeneutical issue. Uh, there, are, there are many individuals within the context of the Christian tradition who read that very differently, who read that not as literal, uh, but rather as metaphysical, as, as, um, as, a, as a really more of a, a parable or a, a metaphor than something that is going to literally happen. Um, and so I, I think that, that it's important that we ap apply this hermeneutical suspicion um, to see if people like my good friend and colleague Eric Rayton is right that, that human, I mean, that Christian universalism is, you know, the appropriate way to go or, you know, kind of along the lines that Rob Bell kind of argued for uh, a Christian universalism. So, so, so it's, it's, it's not, it's a hermeneutical question, right? You know, is this the proper way to interpret that text? If so, well, then, okay. If not, well, then, you know, but, but no one has the, the market cornered in hermeneutics. Hermeneutics is something that is open to all thinking people, and they're going to disagree. I disagree with many people, you know, quite frequently about the way to interpret a text, and I would disagree with someone who says that uh, Jesus is going to come back in that particular kind of way. I'm not a, I'm not a you know, a, 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 what we call a premillennialist. Um, I don't think that he's going to come back in that particular kind of way, or that he might even come back at all, you know. Um, perhaps he's already, he's come once, and that's good enough, and it's now now up to us to bring the kingdom of God here on earth uh, by our good deeds and by participating in morality and the fight for social justice. That's how I would approach it. Um, but of course, there are many people who disagree with me. So it's a, it's a it's a constant fight. It's a constant fight. Could I ask you a question about that? Um, so I'm in the American South and uh, in Memphis, and a lot of people. Oh man, Tennessee. Oh man. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, a lot of people in town refer to Memphis as the city of churches because there's a church on every corner, and uh, <laughs> I think that is directly related to what you're just talking about because it seems like you can almost take the interpretation as far as you want to go with it. And I was wondering um, to you or, or to anyone who feels they know Rakur well, um, what is it that anchors? Because um, it, it seems to me that it, his symbolic approach to interpretation is very useful um, if the goal is to save the text from irrelevance or antiquity or something like that. But I wonder what anchors it to meaning or meanings that you could put any kind of bracket around um, and... and I, I, I mean, I, I suppose that you know you could take the position that as long as it's useful, you know, that's enough. Mm -hmm. But I find myself, like, kind of somewhat sympathetic, I guess, in, in, to some of the literist, literalists in some ways that they might want to, or that they might be, I can see why they're irked by that, that they, they might feel that, you know, this text uh, no longer has any meaning or it's be become so diluted through so many interpretations, that you can really fill these words up kind of with whatever content you want to, as long as you can make a convincing argument for it. And for to me, it's difficult to not see how religion then becomes this ironic kind of thing where, um, I guess just from my personal temperament, I find difficult to fully relate to then. I mean, I'm, I'm not a particularly religious person, but I, I have in the past... Uh, you know, been involved and had family members who are very religious. So it seems like, you know, nobody I know that is extremely religious or, in, or involved in that who gets a lot of meaning out of it takes an ironic approach to their religion. It's very sincere. So I don't know. 
if that's too rambling for you to get anything out of, but if you had any comments on that, I'd appreciate it's it. It's not. It's not. And I'd love to hear Law's a, a opinion about that. The, the idea that we shouldn't look for what is useful, but we should look for what is true. And if we arrived at something that is true, the true sentiment behind this text, would we know it? Hmm. And is that just a crutch, ultimately? Because I think what people would argue on the other side is that the reason why they, we need to have this constant, open, like uh, living document approach to the Bible is because, it, you know, how convenient that we have a new, modern, more tolerant version of the text in today's world, when in reality it, it, it could otherwise be labeled as completely ir irrelevant, as the Count was saying. <laughs> well, there, there's so many readings, you know, and so many that contradict each other. Other, as you were talking about earlier, there's misogynistic readings, there's oppressive readings, there's you know progressive liberal readings. There's you know mm -hmm. it, for any culture, it seems like you can you can find something that'll correspond, and, and you can see that as a strength or a weakness. Right. Um, I mean, I, I have thoughts, Ken, if you're interested in, in weighing in. But 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 one thing that um, I will say about Recur in particular, uh, at the very beginning of his critique of religion. Um, really, this is, this is a segment out of a larger book. But anyway, at the very beginning, he talks about Christianity is supposed to be the kerygma, um, an exact meaning, an announcement, a proclamation, a message. And he goes on to say that demystification deals precisely with um, with address uh, with addressing this uh, and to whom it is addressed and whatnot. And so he goes on to, to say in our reading that that Wes and, and the other guys and I talked about is that part of the work of hermeneutics is to get past that that surface stuff to get down into the depths of what is really really there and sometimes getting past that surface thing has to do with getting past the misogyny and getting past um, the racism to be quite quite you know quite honest about it and things like that to get down to the to the depths of it so I can understand how people might be uh, uncomfortable uh, and say that you know that unless we have a hard reading of a particular text then we don't have any reading. I'm sympathetic. I understand where that where that comes from, but I don't think that that undermines the need for the variety of readings and for the you know the variety of hermeneutics. And, and I can understand why people may say that that waters it down some, uh, but I don't. I'm, I'm not sure that they're right about that. I I think that the that the that the actual the that the fact that we can do so much work and have so many different uh, interpretations of the text is actually a strong point. Uh, it speaks to the strength of the text, and it speaks to uh, just how uh, polyvalent the text is and has and how it has so much meaning uh, to so many people in so many different uh, circumstances. And I, I'm not sure that's a weakness, really. But, Ken, I'm really interested in hearing what you have to say about that. that, that thanks. Yeah, actually, the um, what I hear from... Um uh, Stephen and the Count is that um, we, it's interesting to ask for a methodology of hermeneutics, which is not just subjective, not just you know goal oriented in terms of you know finding some kind of meaning in the text, but is there a um, you know a, a criterion of adequacy? Is there a criterion of correctness for applying an interpretation to a text? Uh, and this doesn't have to be um, you know, black and white is are you are you right or are you wrong about what it means? But it can be uh, you, you could um, and anybody who's dealt with uh, ancient text or with literature is going to realize that there's a you can get a, a lot of information out of a certain text by looking at it one way. You can get you know a little bit less looking at a certain another way. You can get you know or an overlap. I mean, you can learn something from a text and miss other points. Yeah, you know? and this is this is true for every work of literature. Uh, yeah, it, it's also true for ep any set of historical documents or archaeological evidence. You, you can take a certain perspective on evidence and learn some things from it and leave other questions uh, unresolved. But the, uh, where I come to the topic of hermeneutics is from an interest in Donald Davidson and radical interpretation. And what I like about that particular starting point to, uh, to look at hermeneutics is that radical interpretation is intended to fit uh, right into the analytic uh, philosophical paradigm of you know, formal semantics and uh, classical logic, and uh, uh, and then fold these issues of you know, a thesis which partly uh, is consistent with a certain body of evidence and is partly consistent with a different body of evidence. 
you know, this is a this is an epistemological situation that we find ourselves in in a lot of different areas of you know, humanities and social science. Um, and Davidson's radical interpretation <coughs> fits this uh, epistemological problem into uh, an analytic ver view of semantics, where you know, eventually you know, meaning has to fit into formal logic, and we have, we, we're going to have to decide at some point certain you know, propositions are true and other propositions are false. We're going to get behind some of them and oppose others. Um, well, that I'm not I'm not sure about that. That's quite true. I mean, if uh, your definition I, of meaning, I, I, said quite, I said quite a bit. Which which part of it do you think is not true? <laughs> Uh, well, I didn't like the beginning, and I was getting uh, far away by the end. Um, <laughs> uh, so, I mean, it's the, the thing that prompted me to intervene was the idea that meaning is the truth conditions of propositions. I mean, that's one definition of meaning. And right. if you circularly assert that that's what your meaning is, then yes, you need classical logic in order to establish uh, the correct structures for determining meaning. But I, I think we can access something a bit more general than that. Um, but I, I wanted just to not get too far into logic before I come back on something that Lawrence said. And I think, uh, I'm not sure what the name is, Count, uh, there we go, Count said, um, that, uh, that, religious people, that religious people who interpret texts literally, uh, that, that, that they should be persuaded by uh, some value to hermeneutics. And I, I think the, the, the stronger and the more passionate religious people are, the more credit we're, we're likely to give them, or we're, we're inclined to give them, that they know what they're talking about, and I don't often think that they do. Yeah, I you agree. Know, I completely agree with you. I think that you find, you know, people who shout and scream about family values, and you ask them what their values are, and you find no family values at all. Mm -hmm. And I think when you have fundamentalists screaming, shouting and screaming about biblical literalism, and you ask what are they biblically literal about, and you find it's very little at all. I think we're liable to confuse a fundamentalist mentality with a with a objective reading of the Bible, and I don't think they read the Bible objectively at all. I think they may read one or two bits of it objectively, but then they interpret away a, a vast majority of it. It's just of opportunistic hermeneutics rather than a consistent one, and I don't think we should be dragged down into the uh, the, the debate with a fundamentalist by granting them all the things that they will claim of themselves without establishing it first. I think that's a very dangerous thing to do. I think uh, you're absolutely right, Michael. I, I, I mean, I, if I can just kind of say amen a little bit to that, I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, uh, you're, you're, an, you're an atheist, right, Michael? Oh, yes, unfortunately. And, and, and I'm saying amen to you. I'm in a really tough position. But, but, <laughs> no, Latin, but Latin for let it be so, isn't it? Something like that. <laughs> something like that. But, but, but um, honestly, I think you're onto something because I think what you find with many individuals uh, is that they, um, they will pick, you know, they will pick something and they will be very literal about that, but, the, but they will eat pork or they will eat, uh, you know, mm -hmm. other world clothing with two different, you know, kinds of cloth woven together. And so you're absolutely right that they are, they, they, they pick things to be fundamentalist about, um, um, or literalist, maybe a better way to say it, to be literalist about, uh, but they're not consistent with their literalism. So I think that's very well stated, man. That's a really, really good point. Yeah, well, it, 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 one of my irritations is the, uh, that le people on the left, liberals especially, are willing to grant so much to people in debates with them on the basis that they assert it passionately. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we're yeah. protecting these values, we're protecting these values. You know, you find on one hand, to be even more politicized, you know, that they have a very rugged economic theory and that they're defending the family and both of these two things mean that women have two jobs <laughs> and the rest of it. And you find that if you follow all these things out, that you, you end up in all kinds of confusions. And um, so, I, so I don't think hermeneutics has a political element insofar as it isn't able to engage with people of that kind, because I don't think what they're looking for is more information about how to correctly interpret a text. I don't think that's the bit missing. You know, the thing that hasn't clicked for them is, oh, they needed to read Gadamer, and it was, all, oh, that's nice. Now it's clear where, where we went wrong. <laughs> I, I think the, the way of engaging those people has to be much more contextual, and actually it relates perhaps to a reading of the text itself. It can relate to the two problems. Uh, I was going to say much earlier that when you look at uh, any society, you have to look at what options are available to the members of that society in order to judge how moral they were. I mean, we can talk about moral in an absolute sense, and I'm quite happy to do that, and to say, you know, slavery in ancient Greece was horribly immoral, and so on and so on and so on. 
but then we have to look at what were the intentions of the people trying to be, what constraints were they under, and how did they bear those intentions out in that circumstance. And You're really flirting with relativism, though, man. I mean, that, that makes me very uncomfortable when you start talking about slavery within a particular context being acceptable, perhaps. No, um, no, no. Not acceptable. Okay. Okay. Not acceptable. I'm, okay. I'm completely the opposite. I'm objective okay, about... Okay, there we go. There we go. There we go. Okay, I see. Okay, there we go. I, I misunderstood. Go ahead. What I'm saying is, let's suppose, okay, let's take this, let's take this, right? So let's say, let's go over to a hypothetical situation where sure, uh, sure. A, a landowner has a lot of money and buys up a lot of slaves, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what is he doing in that situation? Well, he's doing something in an absolute sense, objective sense, deeply immoral. Right. But suppose he does that in order to deprive someone else of those slaves, in order that that person, that those slaves be prevented from being mistreated by that other person who would be liable to buy them up, right? Now, you say to yourself, how are we to interpret this person's action. Mm -hmm. I think on one grounds we should definitely say that the whole system is immoral. True. On another we should say this person was attempting to act on a moral principle which is correct, which is to say to minimize the amount of needless suffering that a certain group of people have to endure. Um, so, what, so what I was getting at is that the constraints on people's actions are important to consider when trying to understand their moral intents and their behavior and it is not relevant it's not not relativism at all to say that mm -hmm. uh, given the you know the, the social norms that people have at one time or another see I don't want to rant too much. I, no, I, I mean, I, I, understand, I understand what you're saying. I understand what you're saying. I mean, of course, I'm tempted to go in the weeds here on this one because I'm, you know, I, I, I do race, but um, I'm tempted to go in the weeds and talk about, you know, how a person should not that there's no such thing as a good slave owner that that the system in and of itself is evil, and so participating in that system in any way, um, you know, dirties your dirties your hands. And I'm, I'm really tempted to go into the weeds where we're talking about recur, but we should we should probably talk about this another time. But that's a that. That's an interesting situation that I have many thoughts about, but that's an interesting situation. Go ahead. Uh, well, if, if I still have the mic, I end up giving a lecture. I mean, so to jump right back, um, yeah, yeah. I thought the, the first thing, one of the first things Stephen said was, why don't you use Harry Potter? And I, I, I mean, you were quite happy to entertain that in a kind of uh, genial way. And I, I kind of, I've kind of found that a bit flippant because, you mm. know, these texts occupy... Uh, a position of meaning in a larger network of ritual, meaning, practice, history, culture. The content of these texts is irrelevant to their position in that network of meaning. The text mm. could be anything, but that network never exists and it's all referring to this text. So you can't just say, well, why don't you use Harry Potter? Because it doesn't resonate with, you know, two billion people. Right. Unfortunately, today it's only half a billion. No, not not two. Right. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to jump in on that because the um, at the very least we want to be able to look at a text, you know, whether it's you know, Tom Sawyer or whether it's uh, uh, the Old Testament, and say that we're finding something in this text that makes it part of the canon. But at least this is a relevant question to ask. Now the uh, does a certain text belong in the canon? Now, should we perpetuate the power structures that have been built around certain texts? Or should we, um, as, uh, as thinking people, as you know, uh, we're trying to educate each other, we're trying, uh, so, you know, some of us are um, uh, ed professional educators, and we're edu responsible for the next generation, and we want to make some kind of decision looking at the content of the text. So, so at least I can ask the question, under what circumstances is it relevant to look inside the text at its content and then argue from the content toward the question of whether this particular text belongs in a canon that the rest of the society should uh, either orient itself towards or orient itself against. Yeah. And, and this is what I see as the value of a um, hermeneutics pursued as a um, um, as a, as a rigorous discipline. You know, we're going to say, I'm seeing this meaning in the text, and here's you know, here's a passage, here's another passage, here's another passage. These all fit together, 
And when we look at them all this way, like taking a certain word in a certain sense, or taking a certain situation in an allegorical way rather than a literal way, or looking at the, at the text historically as opposed to um, universally, so all of those different hermeneutical decisions have a lot to do with what content you find in the text. And then the, the decision as to what content you find in the text has a lot to do with what arguments you can make over what role the text should have in contemporary society or in contemporary politics. Hmm. Okay. Um, if I mean, to, to put this extremely flippantly, uh, I think it would be a different kind of revelation if it was discovered that Jesus Christ was gay than if it was discovered that when it was discovered that Albus Dumbledore was gay. Um, Wait, Dumbledore was gay? <laughs> yeah. Get out of here, man. That's, no, I, I, I totally didn't read the seventh book. Is is that what it was about? Is that what the half blood prince was was referring to? <laughs> there, there was a disciple who was saved. I wouldn't. Uh, whoa, well, wait, whoa, well, wait. <laughs> I wouldn't say that that's what the book was about. But I do believe it was it was revealed in the in the book that 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 was part of what was going on there. Um, he was having sex okay. with Harry uh, Potter. I, I'm sorry. No. This is like this is paradigm <laughs> shifting right here. What you're telling me. Dumbledore was gay, and all of the mentorship, all of the, the the fatherly advice, it was all just a requisite to try to get him in his chamber. This wow. isn't a this is an apocryphal version. So this is disgusting. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I have no problem with the gay lifestyle. I was about to say, yeah, we're flirting with homophobia there. I mean, look, I would, um, I, I, I'm comfortable, Ken, with us constantly looking at the text. Uh, of course, this is a radical liberal position, but I'm very comfortable with us constantly looking at the text, constantly reevaluating, saying, does this belong here? I'm very comfortable with that. In fact, I think that, that re that's something that requires us, that we should do that, um, particularly in light of the fact that many texts are just blatantly homophobic, blatantly, um, you know, blatantly patriarchal. But that does open the door to something that, that many Christians are going to be uncomfortable with, which is saying, well, then if, um, if, 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 you know, if some texts are problematic, then all texts are problematic. And, and, and I think that what that speaks to is the, no, is the kind of inclination within fundamentalism and, and literalism to make the text their God instead of allowing God to be their God and the text to speak to God, if that makes any sense. Um, and so one of the things that we have to be very diligent about, those of us who are inside of the tradition and those of us who are forward thinking and who are, you know, um, humanists, if you will, even within the tradition, uh, that we have to be careful that we do not allow the text. Because I, I've known people who've gone to seminary, I went to school with them, who they come to know that certain pro parts of the Bible are, are problematic or perhaps not divinely inspired, and they lose their entire faith. I mean, they just completely go bonkers. And, and what's happened is that they have allowed the text to become their God instead of allowing the, God to, the text to speak to God, if you will. Um, and, and I know this is kind of inside baseball, and I'm talking to people who don't believe in God, but that's, that's kind of what I'm thinking about inside the tradition. And so I think Ken, that it, it is wise of us to constantly search these texts and say, hey, does this belong here? Um, is this something that, you know, that Paul is saying for him, or is he saying this in a divinely inspired way? And I would say that some of those texts are not divinely inspired. Um, but, but whether they, but they may have good things to say to us, but they're not perhaps divinely inspired. And so we need to be uh, very diligent about how we approach these texts. So I think you're up to something there, Ken. Well, you Good. Well, good. I, I, this is a point I think where you and me and Michael are, are, are um, uh, saying some of the same things. And if, if I understand Michael correctly, there's a there's an element within the fundamentalist community which is treating the text in a very manipulative way, uh, and and it, it, the the accusation can be made that they aren't even trying to learn the text, uh, learn from the text. Uh, they aren't even trying to learn from the document as a whole. They're just, you know, using whichever uh, uh, you know, uh, citation they can to, uh, uh, to advance their position. To to, to, to get to, or, you know to gain attention, you know, to, and it can get as venal uh, as, as you want, you know, in, in American politics nowadays. 
if I may just uh, add a complexity to the issue. Um, so I'm wondering what the relationship between the text and our conclusions about, say, morality, the world, etc., is. Are we to take it that the text is a license for us to believe certain things, a justification for us to do certain things, or are we to take it that we already have uh, a way of acting and behaving that we're trying to, I don't know, um, bring bring into alignment or or communicate with what's there in the text? I mean, it it it, it can't be the case, really. Uh, that the text is meant to just license our behavior, that what we do is we go, oh, can I do this, can I do that? No, I will look up rule 614. Oh, yes, I can do that. It, it's, it's, it seems like it has to be, um, you know, I have these prejudices, you know, prejudices um, coming in. I have a system of values, and the text isn't there to tell me what the right answer is. It is there to be in a kind of reflective equilibrium, to use an analytic term, uh, with my values. So it's a conversation I'm having with another person in order to discuss morality as we might do right here now, but rather than another person being there to help me work things through morally, there's a text there, and that text can challenge me, and it can be wrong, and it can be right. But the important thing is that it that it features in my uh, culture, system of meaning, background, etc., as an important quote quote person to talk to. You know, you know, you, in England you used to have uh, a hell of a lot of uh, churches that are now nightclubs. But in those churches there would be vicars, and you would go to your vicar, and that would be your counselor. Um, and even to the 1940s and 50s, uh, you would have that. And it seems like that if you were to have a marriage or a death or whatever, it would be a major crisis, that that would be the person you go and talk to. And I don't think it's unfair or doing any injustice to say that we should treat Scripture in that way, not as an authority on what you should do, not as a license for what you should do, but as something to talk to, to work out what it is you think is the right thing to do. Now, that's obviously somewhat liberal, but I think it's entirely cons consistent with the conservative position in Christianity or any other religion as well. I think that's a potentially extremely conservative position. There's no divinity there necessarily, right? I mean, if if, if I mean, if essentially all, all it is is a moral tuning fork for us to uh, bounce our ideas off of and become to like an equilibrium, as you say, I mean, that implies no God, and that kind of is a big... Depends who you point. think is speaking. Depends who you think is speaking. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with Michael. It, it depends on who you, who you think is speaking as well. I mean, I, I do think that, that there's some value there in, in approaching the text as, as though you're having a conversation. Um, I, I think that's. I think. I think that that many moral thinkers within the Christian tradition, Niebuhr being one, maybe Bultmann to a, to a degree, uh, maybe Bart as well. Well, not no, not Bart. Bart's too conservative for that. But certainly Tillich uh, will, will probably ap uh, agree with that. Um, you know, approaching the text in that way, and 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 what that opens the door for is that someone who doesn't see divinity in the text can say, well, this is. Um, a book with some moral positions in it, that Jesus is doing a lot of moral teachings there, um, and, and that I can subscribe to that or not. But, you know, certainly it's resonated with people for 2,000 years. A person who is within the tradition can say, yeah, you know, uh, I like these moral teachings. Because let's just be honest, Christians get into a lot of fights about divinity and theology and very little fighting about, you know, you know, applying these things. You know, Christians can be some of the most immoral people with the right beliefs. And they think that their right beliefs, um, you know, uh, get them out of any kind of commitment to fighting for justice and, and fighting on the side of, uh, you know, on the right side of certain kinds of issues. And so... I think that one way that we can approach it is by saying that, yeah, that, that Jesus is doing something that is radical. He's doing something that is on the side of justice as he understands it and as I understand it, to be honest. Um, and that uh, that's a starting point. That's something that, that people who are both inside of the tradition and outside the tradition will agree. And the people who are outside the tradition, they're going to object to many of the things in the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible, as I prefer to call it. Um, but I, I, I find very I find it very hard to believe that they would disagree with some of the inclinations that Jesus are, are teaching, that, that, that Jesus is teaching. You know, some of the things like, you know, care for the widow, those who are outcasts, care for those who are marginalized, fighting against, uh, the, you know, fighting against things like racism. I think that Jesus would be very much in line with that. And I find a 
I find it very difficult that Michael or any other person who was outside the tradition would disagree with that. Uh, you can, can you I, as well, Stephen. Can I say something very quickly? Can I defend Job, oh, and, Ecclesi Job and Ecclesiastes? We don't need to throw away the oh, whole okay. thing. No, now that I'm with you. I'm with you on Job and Ecclesiastes. That's what I wrote about. So yes, I, I'm with you on Job and Ecclesiastes. No, Go ahead. The, yeah. the wisdom tradition. Talk about it. Well, I, I'm not, I mean, I don't want to get into it too much, but you know, I think all this talk of Jesus Christ is, Christ is, you know, it's all it's all the cheapest things. I mean, yes, pacifism is good and the rest of it, but also uh, is the fundamental meaninglessness of the universe that is expressed in both Job and Ecclesiastes for me, and I think is there in the text that. You know, you've got um, in Ecclesiastes, uh, you know, a, you know, a, a hu humility, humilitizing of human life there, a humbling of human people and of human projects, and uh, a contextualizing of human practice and and our values and uh, you know, the great many things in there. I mean, when I reread that, uh, I reread that a couple of years ago. I have to have read it about sixteen or something, and I said, no, no, actually, Ecclesiastes is better at Sartre. Better than Sartre, what Sartre was trying oh, to do. Oh, absolutely. It's very existential. Very existential, no doubt. Yeah, I, I think, Dope you know, well. people are off, are off praising Sartre for all these great insights, and I think it's just a, a hackish Hegelian imi imitation <laughs> of Ecclesiastes. It's just, oh, throw some consciousness oh, in there, and it's Ecclesiastes. Dots fired. <laughs> dots fired. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, We're ready to get well, rid well, of well, being well, and nothingness now. Well, I, I got I got to jump in to join the praise for uh, existentialism at Ecclesiastes, <laughs> uh, but the um, um, while while we're comparing the Old Testament to existentialism, I think we also have to keep in mind that the the New Testament has to be compared to Plato. Mm -hmm. So the uh, um, the on the one hand. Um, if we're gonna if we're gonna engage in a in a historically informed hermeneutics of these texts, then we have to see each particular contribution uh, in terms of the historical um, um, the the literary history of, of that contribution. So you know the the writers of the Gospels, you know, were uh, educated in Greek and writing in Greek, and. Uh, um, uh, at the last I heard, you know, the, the, the Gospels were actually uh, the, the Gospels that are now part of the canon uh, were, were decided upon you know, around 100 A.D. and the only parts of the New Testament that are anywhere near contemporaneous with uh, Christ Himself are some of the letters of Paul. Um, oh, I, I disagree with that, but carry on. Well, I, I'm uh, I, I, I'm not a, a scholar of the issue myself. I'm just I'm citing uh, Gary Wilkes, but. Uh, well, no, Ken, if, if I can just say this, you, you are right that Paul are the oldest of the writings, and then the uh, the Gospels are somewhere in the area of, depending upon the timing of it, 60, 70, and of course John being the latest of the Gospels. So you're right that the Gospels are the oldest of the text, and Paul's writing being among the earliest in the New Testament, though. Now, of course, old te uh, the Hebrew Bible, we're talking about much much late, much you know earlier than that, but you're right about that as far as the historical timing of that. Um, uh, th th these issues of timing are relevant only if, well, and I think th this is this is a profound issue as well as a delicate one. You know, the um, once we are willing to look at the timing of these texts, we've all, we've gone, we've we've raised a family of issues, which I would say are anathema to the fundamentalists. Yeah, the uh, so well, if, if we're anathema to themselves. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, um, so, uh, and th this is perhaps one of the. Uh, well, th this is, this is one of the great issues of of our day in the twenty first century. You know, um, the uh, should we be addressing fundamentalism in religion as uh, you know with, with arguments and with reasoning, or should we be addressing fundamentalism as as an irrational cult which is. Uh, uh, you know, preying upon uh, um, you know uh, unfortunate people or, or people with uh, you know, reduced uh, reduced capacities, and uh, it, it, it's more of a you know a, a mental health and a public uh, public safety issue. Um, the um, there's a in, in America at least there's a lot of fundamentalists who really want to be treated as intellectually respectable, 
And well, I, 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 for one, would want to deny that that uh, that that kind of interaction at all. You know, it, it's really, uh, it's it's just such bad theology to treat these you know, some of these scriptures as if they're un, as they're su supernatural. Uh, you know, the um, uh, we're we're underappreciating what these texts have to tell us about the role of the divine in human history if we ignore the historical reality of the scriptures. Yeah, and, and, and I will say this. I have to go here in a, mo in a moment, gentlemen. Uh, but, but I will say this also if, if we're defending other, you know, Hebrew, Hebrew uh, Bible texts, then, of course, we also have to defend the prophets. Man, I think that um, the prophets for me speak most clearly to us social justice and uh, Abraham Joshua Heschel wrote a phenomenal a phenomenal um, a book about the prophets and just did a, a wonderful Abraham Joshua Heschel is in fact a philosopher of religion and he was rather a philosopher of religion also marched with King and whatnot uh, but he did a, a brilliant I would say uh, philosophical analysis of the Hebrew uh, the Hebrew Bible specifically of the prophets um, and, and anyone who's interested in reading deeper into that and, and seeing how he employed hermeneutics as his approach is very interesting and, and quite recurrent, I would argue. Uh, please read that. But uh, Ken and Count and Michael and Stephen and Wes, it has been a pleasure. I hope you guys have a great evening, continue the conversation, but just wanted to tip in for a little bit and say hello. Lawrence, thank, thank you, you so much for your time. As always, that was great. Man. Take care, guys. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm still having a hard time getting to the bottom of how we can ever determine whether we've arrived at some sort of end point at using hermeneutics. And if we can't, does that make all inquiry into the matter not necessarily meaningless, as uh, Law was referring to, but valueless? And that, I mean, there's no way that we can use it to, I mean, make any sort of interpretation about how we ought to be living. It, that is in correspondence with the creator of the universe. It will always be some subjective interpretation that we've come to that corresponds with the way we're currently doing things in modern society. You, I don't know. I'm be currently being phased by the similarity of your voice to Howard Stern. So I'm, I'm thinking of <laughs> Howard Stern saying all this. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> and he's got that kind of incredulous pauses where he goes, well, what's, you know. Uh, but Incredulous so... pauses. <laughs> First you tell me Dumbledore's gay. Now you're telling me I sound like <laughs> Howard Stern. Uh... I feel like my whole world has been shattered. Anyway, go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, no. Um, well, so there's, there's, there's a few things to say. First of all, I, so the idea that, that God wrote these things and therefore God has an opinion on what they say, I, don't, I think very few people would believe that. And if you don't believe that, then immediately you are saying that um, these, the, the, there, will be, there will be a plurality of interpretations available. But that's um, the... I mean, like that's the end goal that they're trying to arrive at, though, is to arrive at some sort of uh, moral code that has been purveyed by the creator of the universe. I, I, I get that it's a daunting task. I get that it's, it's difficult, and it takes time in the process of hermeneutics and uh, analysis. But, I mean, isn't that ultimately the end goal? Well, that's the end goal of the fundamentalists. And my, my, what, what my contribution to the discussion, uh, I, 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 I keep pushing it over and over again, is that uh, hermeneutics is the antidote to fundamentalism. No. Mm, I disagree with that. I mean, I, I, I think you can have a... First of all, I think you can have a perfectly hermeneutical fundamentalist. I just don't think the fundamentalists you're thinking about uh, are consistent. They're just, they're just, it's not a question of um, which academic position they take with respect to what, you know, what attitude one ought to have toward, toward the text. The, the, you know, I think you would find... Um, orthodox Jews <laughs> who are extremely hermeneutical, uh, who are nevertheless saying, well, you know, let's kill these people, let's kill those people, and the rest of it. I mean, um, so I think, to put it in that way, you know, being a Jew is not <laughs> a guide to being moral or a guide to getting the right non fundamentalist interpretation of a text. Well, my, Michael, actually, uh, let, 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 me, let me take another turn on that issue. I think what, what you, I think, are saying to me, if, if I can be a little bit uh, metaphorical about it. What you're saying is that you can kill yourself with an antidote. And I, 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 can, I can grant that point. You know, the, um, you know, the, I'm not saying that 
anyone who is hermeneutical will reach a correct conclusion. Uh, what I'm saying is that the, um, the, 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 the intellectually responsible uh, it, I, I think there's some agreement in, uh, in, in it's, it's, I see Stephen here as, um, um, as as really pushing on a fundamentalist kind of approach to a text and I'm trying to, in, on the one hand, encourage uh, the attitude I see him as taking, which is that fundamentalism is fundamentally wrong. Yeah, they're, they're, they're making a mistake in how they approach a text. And, I've, and I also want to add that the best way to see why the fundamentalists are making a mistake about the text is to use hermeneutics. It's, let me say, actually, let me restate that not to use hermeneutics to criticize the fundamentalists, but rather to see the um, epistemological process which is going on within hermeneutics and see like that process can be pushed uh, in, a, in a negative direction. It can, it can be, it be used incompetently or it can be used competently to, uh, to undermine the fundamentalists. So, um, um, I, I hope that's a, that's a, a useful comment. It, it, it totally makes sense, and it's useful. I just have a question. I mean, it, I mean, let's take the fundamentalism out of the equation. Maybe I'm going to be fundamentalist in doing this. But I feel like if ultimately the point... I mean, you yourself said that you more look at the Bible and these, you know, the, the Old Testament and the New Testament as two historical documents that are living and that they have progressed the morality of human beings. Uh, Michael, I believe, said we should use it as some sort of moral tuning fork. There is some sort of utility we're going for. There, there's some sort of use that these things have. And I guess what I'm wondering is, if it is completely open-ended, I, I guess I'm prefacing it by saying, how can we ever know that we're arriving at the true sentiment behind this historical document? Let's take out the creator of the universe from it. And if we can't arrive at an end game, then what use is it at all as, as us when trying to you know, further our moral understanding, as you said? Uh, well, it's not completely open-ended. I mean, you, no one's suggesting you fry it or, or roast it, right? Uh, there's a, a limited set of purposes that one has in mind when trying to read scripture and uh, a limited set of valid purposes one has in mind. And what you're saying is that if you start out with a particular goal, you can define a standard of good and bad, a standard of ex excellent and a, and a variety of interpretive methods given that goal and come out with an interpretation that is a good interpretation given that goal. But people have different goals. That's all very well and good. None of that undermines the idea that there is excellence of interpretation and none of that undermines the idea that communities of people can come together with a particular purpose in mind and that purpose be a good purpose and leading to good interpretations and good moral values and the rest of it. Uh, plur you know, a, a pluralism of method, a pluralism of purpose and a pluralism of excellence or goodness with respect to interpretation does not um, somehow imply that uh, because you know because there's no one canonical purpose to put a text to does not mean that any given purpose is somehow less valuable or undermined by the existence of many others. Um, d does that make sense? I feel that was a very abstract way of putting it. So, Michael, if I'm understanding you right, you're you believe that. You could get to the bottom of it through argument, whether or not a fundamentalist is being consistent. Well, let's let's be very let's take a very direct, very simple example, right? There's a manual for building a table, an IKEA manual for building a table. Now, if you want to build a table, there's definitely a way of interpreting that manual, uh, arriving at a standard of goodness and badness and perfection and excellence and rightness and wrongness with respect to that manual and table building that is valid, legitimate, objective, and the rest of it, right? If you've read the manual properly and you've built a table properly, anyone can see that you've done all that correctly, that you've read the manual properly, you've read, you know, if you've done all your interpretation accurately, all, all these wonderful good things that are objective and, you know, there in the world and the rest of it. Now, if you want to read a design manual for the purposes of writing another design manual, you think, oh, I'll flick through this and I'll have a look what the other author has done, so when I'm writing my own, I can be inspired, by, you can have a look at how he's laid things out. If at the end of that you've built a table, you've probably done something wrong. Um, so, you know, the people who are off building tables with the Bible are not somehow 
if, you know, doing something irrational or wrong or underhanded or undermined by the fact that people who are looking at the Bible and trying to write their own uh, rather than building tables out of it. Um, so what I'm saying is that the existence of a plurality of purposes um, does not in any way subjectivize, make contingent, relativize, or anything else uh, the practices of one group of people because another group of people are doing something different, right? You still get tables out of it and you still get other design books out of it. But wouldn't we still need some kind of uh, overall idea of what a good table is? Yeah, it seems pretty arbitrary. That's what I was going to say. No, I mean, a good table is defined with respect to the purpose you're using the book for, right? I mean, if you build it, if the book is, is designing a table out of wood and you end up with a plastic table that you've made in a cast, then it's pretty obvious you've gone wrong, right? The, the book is about carpentry, not about plastic forming. Uh, I mean, if you if you read the Bible and come out with I don't know, uh, let's see, uh, flower arrangement for under twenty year olds. If you if you read Ecclesiastes and think mm, the tulips don't go well with a black dress, you've done you, you know there's something wrong going on there. If you if you read Job and come out with oh. God's screwing around with us all, or if you read Job and you go, oh, God doesn't handle have a good handle on the universe, or read Job and come out with, well, maybe everything's meaningless and we should just try to strive against struggles, then all of those things are different readings. They, they put the book to different purposes, but, but those readings are not somehow uh, t tell, uh, depriving the mind of God or depriving the text of, uh, you know, a meaning, a substance, a... Uh, you know, a, a use, if that makes so, sense. So, yeah, there are such things as bad interpretations, and there are good interpretations, but there are a plurality of good interpretations. Yeah. Is that, is that the... Yeah. Um, depending depending on per, your purposes. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, thanks. The, um, yeah, I, I want to ag agree with Michael here and, and just say the same thing from a, a different point of view, yeah, is that there is an, if there's an epistemological issue with... Um, in understanding the process of hermeneutics. You, know, you want to understand what sort of evidence there is, how you collect that evidence, and how you use the evidence to draw conclusions. And in the case of hermeneutics, the conclusions that you draw is, you know, what's the meaning of a certain passage? Or what's the meaning of you know, a larger passage or of a collection of passages? And we're familiar in philosophy of science about certain bodies of evidence which don't necessarily uh, um, require one unique theory you know, to be consistent with that evidence, but certain bodies of evidence leave a, a multitude of theories you know, um, as of viable candidates. And when that situation occurs, we go do other experiments. And in, um, in the process of understanding texts, you, you often face the same situation. You, have, you look at a certain passage, and it seems to mean a certain thing. You look at another passage, and it seems to be consistent. Then you look at the third passage, and you say, oh, no, he's just telling me to stone my sister. And then uh, you say, well, where did I make a mistake, and do I need another theory? And the, you know, the, the underdetermination under of theory by data, uh, I think, happens in uh, science and in hermeneutics in more or less the same way. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's no more an objection to hermeneutics that sometimes you know the, the ultimate in, un, interpretation is underdetermined, then it is an objection against the scientific method that underdetermination occurs. Yeah. I was just thinking to myself, just just I, almost maybe other influenced by what you were saying, or just before it, I was thinking about a, a you know the Galilean experiment of dropping a bowling ball and a feather, or just yeah. a bowling ball from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. Mm -hmm. I was thinking to myself, you've got Newton there, you've got Galileo there, you've got Einstein there. Let's throw in Lawrence Krauss or some modern idiot. And they're looking at these things, and through all their process of learning, they're interpreting it differently. Now, reality is still happening, and there is truth in all of what those people are seeing, but the activity of Einstein is not depriving the activity of Galileo with their slightly different purposes in mind mm -hmm. uh, of, a, of truth. The mm -hmm. fact that Einstein can say, well, you know, uh, there's a fraction of mass difference within this ball, and Galileo can say, ah, well, uh, we should interpret air friction as impeding and inertia and the rest of it, that all of those people are saying something true, saying something quite, 
quite different, and I think ontologically inconsistent, if you were to ask me, that, that Einstein isn't actually consistent with Newton. That, you know, they're actually fundamentally different, completely inconsistent ways of interpreting the situation. And yet the situation is still happening. Reality is still there. It has just a, a plurality of meanings that one can assign to it in one's interpretation of it. And those meanings can, through their structure, their form, their content, whatever you want to say, embody some kind of truth about the situation. Yeah, I think that's a very deep point. Yeah, I, I agree completely. All right. Awesome. Does anybody else have any questions? I feel like I, I started the show with a launching point, and it has it's led us here. Does anybody have anything they want to say? Wes, do you want to say two sentences before we end the call? Um, <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, I, this has been uh, fascinating to listen to. And uh, I wish I had more to say, but I uh, I thought you guys did a great job, and I um you know it was it was a uh, really fun to to listen to this and and uh, thank you thank you Wes it's great to have you here just your presence meant a lot to us <laughs> Michael as always man yeah I feel like you and Amok if 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 my space was still prevalent, you guys would be on my top eight right now. Like, I have no friends other than you two, Wes, obviously, uh, and my, you know, my extended circle of friends in real life, which consists of, like, two people. So that wouldn't fill up the whole list. <laughs> Ken, I mean, a new face, a new perspective, a, a beautiful perspective, by the way, and a great alternative. I, I feel like a lot, at a lot of points during this, I played devil's advocate, and I asked stupid questions because... I was completely unprepared for this show. But I feel like it went well. It, it actually wasn't as much of a train wreck as I thought it was going to be. The Count. Mm. So great to see you. Daniel, I, I hope you come back. You are always a welcome face here. And uh, I feel like I'm just rambling right now. Does anybody have anything to say before I close this out? Yeah, I, I, I just want to um, say, yeah, that this this was my very first, you know, uh, you know on, online discussion with you all, and it was terrific. You know, the... Uh, uh, I, I learned a lot, and I, I, I hope I was able to contribute you know, for the rest of you, and uh, it'll be fun to do this again. Thank you. What's your background, Ken? BS in mathematics, uh, MA in philosophy, and my career is computer programming. And what about you, Michael? Uh, two degrees in physics, and my career is computer programming. I would just like to thank God for all the gifts he's given me. <laughs> <laughs> that is not at all ironic. Including all right. that, that view, which is... This, uh, which that was is wrestled from God's cold, dead hands, that view. <laughs> all right, this episode has been brought to you by our Lord Jesus Christ, his kingdom above. Uh, hopefully, God willing, we'll all get in there someday. Uh, but I think it's going to be difficult after this episode. Lawrence will pray for us tonight, and I hope to see you all in the next episode of The After Show. Talk to you guys later. Good evening. Thank you, Stephen. <laughs>